what about Adam and Eve? If you've come to understand some things about evolution and genetics and DNA based on your understanding of modern science, is that a reason to jettison or disregard the story of Adam and Eve as found in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible? I'm Dr. Albert Spaulding, and I'd like to welcome you to Transition to Hope, episode number 8, Adam and Eve, part 1, Creation and Fall, where we'll have some food for thought about the subject of Adam and Eve. Welcome. So the story of Adam and Eve is a story of God's creation of man and woman, and God's being, we could say, in fellowship with them, on good terms with them. And he gave them many, many blessings food, plenty of food, vegetables and fruits, an opportunity to enjoy each other, to enjoy God's creation, and to enjoy fellowship with God. God did say to them, though, as God, he said, I have one command, and the command is, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you're going to experience death. As it happens, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. In other words, the, ser the serpent contradicted God's word. And then the serpent went further and said, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that sounded like a pretty good deal for Eve. So when she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that it was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate of it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. As a result of the rebellion, several things happened. Number one, they were removed from the garden and would experience death, and they would be in rebellion, they would, they would, they would continue to be in rebellion against God. And they would not have a way to uh, work themselves back to God. Uh, there would have to be some other way for them to reestablish a relationship with God because they had rebelled against him. God did a couple of things to, uh, to show that he was willing to have a reconciliation with them. First of all, he uh, made skins from animals and fashioned garments for them from the skins of animals who, who died so that they could provide covering for Adam and Eve. And he also made a promise that the, the serpent's head would be bruised, that there would be a a, a victor who would have victory over the serpent and would crush his head. So there were indications of a future redemption, but in the meantime, Adam and Eve, as all of, human ra all of the human race, experience a sense of alienation from God and a sense of being in rebellion to God. Okay, let me talk about red herrings. Uh, red herring is the name of a logical fallacy uh, in, as used in sort of philosophy speak or logic speak. A fallacy that involves a distraction, an, a, an effort to divert attention from the main point of something to a side issue that doesn't really matter. And it's a very common uh, technique or fallacy that's used in discussions about Adam and Eve. Most often, questions of when exactly did Adam and Eve live and how exactly were Adam and Eve created? Were they created exactly in the word picture that is provided for us in Genesis? Or is that word picture somewhat artistic or even poetic or symbolic in some way? Um, uh, and, and if so, uh, if, if, if we're not sure when Adam and Eve may have lived, whether it was 10,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, if, if we don't know when uh, they lived and exactly how they were, they were created, how can we trust anything that the book of Genesis says? How can we trust anything that the Bible says? So we miss the whole point of the story of Adam and Eve and, in fact, the whole point of the Bible, in fact, the whole point of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we somehow set aside Adam and Eve because of some details that we're not sure about in terms of how they showed up on the face of the earth. Another related red herring is the idea of plausibility. And, and the reason that this is a red herring is because it is entirely dependent upon presuppositions. 
if I start out with an atheistic presupposition, I start out with the, the uh, claim, the truth claim, the expectation, the belief, whatever you want to call it, that there is no God, then it limits the possibilities of how Adam and Eve, or for that matter, the human race, could have shown up. But if I allow for the possibility of God, some involvement of God, whether in a, in, in a, in a guided theistic evolution or a you know, species by species, tra uh, uh, you know, variation by variation uh, creation, one by one, uh, or something in between, if I allow for the for the possibility of God, then that that opens up a lot of plausibilities that that can include the plausibility of Adam and Eve. And the and then we could just figure out the probabilities after that. So the the presupposition about whether or not there is a God is going to is going to have a serious, absolutely determinative impact on how I understand the story of Adam and Eve. And so to say that, there, that, uh, that Adam and Eve could not have been created by God because there is no God uh, is, is, is a red herring at best. Many of the fallacies that uh, come, uh, arise uh, in connection with Adam and Eve are really uh, fallacies that, 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 uh, that, are, are, that are housed or articulated in common overstatements. For example, uh, you might hear it said, the evolution of the human race is proven. Well, actually, evolution doesn't prove anything. Uh, evolution is a theory, it's a hypothesis that attempts to explain data. It doesn't do a very good job of explaining the data, but it, and yet that's what it is. Uh, the, the, the data can be proven. Uh, do I have a skull or do I not have a skull? That's a proof. How old that skull is, well, that can involve some scientific techniques, which are certainly uh, up for debate. Um, but evolution itself doesn't prove anything. It's just a theory or a hypothesis that tries to explain some of the data, not all of the data. Uh, and also, you might hear it said that evolution disproves the idea of Adam and Eve. Well, that's a red herring, because if I'm starting out denying the possibility of God, then it's impossible for me to uh, come up with uh, any kind of creative energy, creative being, if you will, designer. Uh, and, and, so, uh, and so evolution is a theory that attempts to counter the idea of the creation of Adam and Eve, but that's as good as you can get. Anything beyond that is an overstatement. We get to hear a lot of these overstatements in a lot of contexts. One place that uh, I heard some, some of these overstatements was a fairly recent Mormon Stories podcast uh, with uh, Mike from LDS Discussions, uh, Mormon Stories uh, episode 1620, Adam and Eve, and Mormon Truth Claims with LDS Discussions, also found on LDS Discussions episode 11. And an example of an overstatement that amounts to a red herring would be the statement there, uh, e either on uh, the LDS Discussions website or actually quoted or shown on the slides in the podcast, uh, DNA evidence is a problem for Adam and Eve historicity that is only getting stronger with time. Actually, the more we know about mitochondrial DNA, the more we, we understand uh, the, the millions and millions of DNA data points that distinguish between the human being and any other primates, uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem is actually growing uh, f for uh, growing against the theory of evolution. Uh, it's, it's, it's creating more and more of a, of a difficulty. So actually the opposite is true. DNA evidence is a, a problem for a, an atheistic, materialistic, naturalistic attempt to explain the origin of the human race. The Adam and Eve story cannot be a literal historical event, given what we know today about evolution, genetics, DNA, and biblical scholarship. Well, there's just a lot to be said there, but the, the idea that it cannot be, and I'll show you this in, in a bit, but, but actually there is no way to uh, make that claim as a fact claim or a truth claim. Uh, it is a conjecture, uh, and we'll see a little bit more about that shortly. 
The story of Adam and Eve cannot be recon reconciled with the vast evidence we have, whether it's genetics, DNA, archaeology, or biblical scholarship, to be a literal historical event. Well, actually, uh, there there are a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of scholarship out there, and 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 if you look at the paleo uh, anthropological timeline, uh, whether it's 4000 BC uh, as such, sorry, whether it's 4000 BC. 40,000 uh, years BC, 140,000 years BC, or 400,000 years BC, uh, there is a lot of data that allows for a continuing discussion about the origin and the headwaters of the human race. Uh, one particular author uh, who is a, a, a Christian scholar and an apologist, uh, someone that, uh, that, that I know, I've met, and, uh, and I've presented papers at the same conferences uh, that he has uh, from time to time, uh, is, a, is one of the three top Christian apologists, evangelical Christian apologists in the world today, William Lane Craig. And he recently published a book called Quest for the Historical Adam. And what he is uh, 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 showing in that, in that book just as an example, is that if you unhitch yourself from uh, a very, very uh, close, uh, somewhat literal understanding of the word day in the Bible, and that's easily done because in two other places of the Bible it does uh, uh, make the observation that the word day is uh, helpful in human terms, but not necessarily in God's term, in terms. It doesn't really... Um, doesn't really uh, explain God's wristwatch, if you will. And so a day to the Lord could be a thousand years, uh, a, a thousand years, uh, you know, and, and a day, th those, those can be interchangeable because God is the creator of time. So if you unhitch yourself from a, a particular literal uh, reading of of, of uh, the word day, and you allow for larger epochs of time to take place, and you go back further in time looking at what appears to be a fossil record that takes us back further in time, um, William Lane Craig uh, observes that, uh, that there appears to be the last common ancestor of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, other human-like uh, uh, part of the family, if you will, of humanoids or human-like uh, species. Um, is uh, Homo heidelbergensis, or Heidelberg man, having lived uh, perhaps as much as 750,000 years ago, and that there, that it, this does not preclude the notion of a historical Adam and Eve, uh, and so, uh, and, and and his his work uh, coincides with a lot of other uh, non-Christian sort of secular uh, work. Uh, as well, paleo and anthropological work, and so it isn't. It, it, it is not necessarily incompatible to look at uh, an early idea of the human race. Early by that I mean 400 to 750 thousand years ago, and to say that, you know that it started somewhere. And when you look at the genetics, you look at the DNA, and you look at the fossil record. Uh, you can you can make a plausible argument for historical Adam and Eve, which you don't have to believe. You can accept it or reject it, whatever you choose. But that's that's a plausible argument that belies the claim that there cannot be a plausible argument. Um, another uh, recent uh, uh, scholarship effort uh, by Joshua Swamidas, who is a professor at Washington University, St. Louis. Uh, who is a computational biologist, has looked at the genealogical record, not just the genetic rec record, but the genealogical record. And again, he allows for uh, the possibility of Adam and Eve to have show showed up uh, anywhere from four to 6,000 years ago, or four to, four to 6,000 years BC, all the way again, all the way out to 400 to 700,000 uh, BC. And he points to the fact that uh, Adam and Eve is a common ancestor, frankly, just like Neanderthals are. Adam and Eve uh, are common ancestors to all of humanity, and he makes the scientific claim for that. And again, what, it, what does that do? It, and, and many atheists 
uh, uh, scientists and uh, paleontologists, anthropologists, and others have agreed with uh, Joshua Swamigdas that he makes a credible case. Uh, so that there could have indeed been a biblical creation of Adam Eve exactly as it's articulated in the Bible. And it's just that we, we don't necessarily need to pin that down at a particular point in time. I'm not I'm not suggesting that these are uh, a better idea of Adam and Eve, uh, that, that Adam and Eve showed up, you know, 40,000, 140,000, 400,000, 700,000 years ago, that that's a better argument than uh, a, a more recent uh, argument. And by the way, I have included uh, the, uh, the websites of both uh, uh, William Lane Craig, reasonablefaith.org. Uh, his type of thinking is also found on bio, BioLogos. And then Joshua Swamidas's website is peacefulscience.org. And I encourage you to uh, take a look at what, what they have to say. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there's also a lot of very credible scientific work done by those who are sometimes called young earthers um, and, uh, and, and uh, work with fossils, work with uh, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and, uh, and at at worst, these, uh, these types of analyses, including uh, the book Zombie Science by Jonathan Wells, which is really a follow-up to an earlier book. This one is More Icons of Evolution. And then Contested Bones by Christopher Roop and John Sanford, and many other uh, works that are similar to this. At worst, they offer a credible, serious, significant critique of some of the evolutionary models and by looking at the same data at, at worst. At best, they offer a credible argument, a plausible argument for, if not necessarily a young Earth, as far as the, the planet Earth, if you want to call it that, uh, but at least a, uh, a more recent appearance of human beings on the Earth uh, as far as, as four to 6,000 years BC. And, and the work that they're doing with mitochondrial DNA um, uh, and, and uh, other uh, techniques uh, really do shed a lot of amazing light on some of these theories that had been uh, extant prior to some of the work done by the so-called young Earth scientists. So all of that is to say that uh, we can we can get ourselves worked up about when and how, what are the mechanics and what is the calendar date of the headwaters of the human race. We can work ourselves up about that. We can we can uh, obsess about the paleoanthropological timelines. Um, we can argue about the evolutionary model of human development. Uh, we can talk about DNA commonality with primates, uh, which to a large extent has been cr discredited. Uh, the whole idea that uh, uh, chimpanzees, for example, have uh, 98 to 99 percent common DNA as human beings, has been largely discredited. It's not even uh, it's not even referenced in Europe because it's that considered that passe by scholars in Europe. Uh, and and and, it, and and part of the reason there's a couple of reasons. One is that it doesn't tell you anything. It's a non sequitur. It does not follow that just because humans and chimps have uh, a certain amount of uh, common DNA that they evolved from a common ancestor. That's a non sucker. It does not necessarily follow any more than I would say because I have 80% DNA, base DNA commonality with a banana, that I evolved from a, a banana. Uh, it's a non sequitur. So, and so all of these are red herrings. Why are they red herrings? Because they are distractors. They get in the way of uh, trying to figure out what's the real significance and meaning and weight of the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis. They are red herrings. Now, before I move on from red herrings, I want to talk about some related and really supporting fallacies that are common in discussions about Adam and Eve or the origin of the human species. Uh, one of those is either or fallacies, sometimes known as a false dichotomy or black and white thinking. And the either or fallacy uh, in these types of discussion really boil down to either there is a specific creation by God 
or there is unguided evolution, that there's no possibility of anything in between. And the problem with the idea of unguided evolution, uh, there are several just glaring, amazing problems with it. Uh, and uh, that includes the origin of DNA, where did DNA actually come from, irreducible complexity, and here the eye is often used as an example, but just about any complex organization or organ can be uh, discussed. And the, the absence or paucity of transitional species. And so the, the, there has to be something else uh, to consider besides A or B, either specific creation by God or unguided evolution. And so uh, evolution uh, is considered, uh, is, is argue, it, it's argued that, it, that it's uh, incompatible with the Bible, but, that, but that's using an either-or fallacy in order to make that claim of incompatibility, incompatibility. If you remove that fallacy, then there can, be in, there can be compatibility with the Bible, as William Lane Craig and Joshua Swamidas and so many others have shown in their work. Uh, another uh, either-or fallacy is either you have young Earth creation, absolutely everything in all of the cosmos being being created 6,000 or 10,000 years ago, or everything was, everything, uh, the, the entire universe and the human race had to have come along billions of years ago, or at least hundreds of thousands of years ago for the human race and many, many billions of years. Um, either you have young earth creation of everything or old earth evolution of everything. And that again is a, uh, is a uh, fallacy, again, as William Lane Craig and Joshua Swamidas have shown and so many others have shown in their work. Another common fallacy connected in particular with uh, evolutionary theory uh, is that uh, evolutionary history is, is the sole causal agent. That, of course, is the result of starting out with uh, the idea there cannot be any design or designer, there cannot be any creator, there cannot be any God. If you start with that presupposition, then you must, you must satisfy yourself with post hoc ergo propter hoc, just because humans seem to appear later in the fossil record than some other primates, it must be that humans evolved from primates. Because it happened afterwards, it happened because of. And that is a logical fallacy and it's certainly one that is not supported uh, in any way by the uh, fossil record. And also there are naturalistic and uniform, uniformitarian presuppositions. Naturalistic, I've already talked about, there can be no supernatural or transcendent or God creator uh, involved. That's the naturalistic uh, presupposition. Uniformitarian presupposition is that everything uh, continues on at the same pace, in the same manner, as it, it, you, you sort of reverse engineer everything back at the same pace, on the same clock, in the same manner that we have now. Uh, that is not what the fossil record shows. It's not what the Bible suggests or declares for that matter. Uh, and th what the fossil record shows and what the Bible declares is that there have been catastro catastrophic events that have, uh, that have appeared suddenly and have resulted in a tremendous change, in particular the Cambrian explosion, for example, uh, uh, where there was a tremendous explosion of species. And you see a lot of other uh, indication, indications of catastrophic events causing fossils. Fossils can't occur without sudden catastrophic burial in, in a particular type of, of uh, uh, environment. Uh, and so catastrophe uh, d belies the uniformitarian presupposition. So that would be a fallacy. I've already talked about red herring uh, fallacies, the timing and historicity of Genesis, the documentary hypothesis, which again has been discredited uh, by, by many scholars, uh, where there's an effort to pin down dates and multiple authors of various books in the Bible, in particular uh, the book of Genesis. And, uh, and what that does, it denies the, the role of oral history. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, just because something may have been um, reduced to writing on a particular type of, of a manuscript uh, 
base or paper or papyrus that we can access today doesn't mean it did, didn't exist in some written form before that, not to mention an oral form. So that, that doesn't help uh, either. That ends up being a fallacy. And then certain assumptions about DNA, uh, which uh, are, are described in, uh, in some of the uh, work done by, uh, by the uh, uh, creation.com and some of the others. Uh, and, and so these end up being red herrings. So what you really wind up with is you wind up with, even if you take the most, I don't know, evolutionary friendly approach, uh, which would be, uh, in, in an example of that would be uh, William Lane Craig's work uh, in search of the historical atom. Uh, even the most uh, evolutionary friendly, uh, you, you find out that it's, that, that the uh, paleo, anthropological timeline is not necessarily incompatible with the Bible. Human evolution in some form or another is not necessarily incompatible with the, the, the Bible. And some idea of common DNA at best is ir irrelevant uh, and, and is not even addressed in the Bible. So if you look again, if you, if you look at a, a work like uh, William, Lane, William Lane Craig's work in search of the historical Adam. Here are some central truths of Genesis 1 to 3 that are consistent with the work that, that he has done uh, and, and the research that he and others have done. That, that, that Genesis uh, shows God as, as one, a personal transcendent creator of all physical reality, perfectly good and worthy of worship. The fossil record, the scientific data is not inconsistent with that. It's only inconsistent with it if you begin to approach the data with a presupposition of atheism. The same thing with God as a designer and sustainer of the physical world um, uh, is only precluded if you start with the presupposition that God doesn't exist. Uh, but if you allow the data to speak for itself, it's not inconsistent with these ideas. It's not inconsistent with the idea that man is the pinnacle of, of creation. Um, it's not inconsistent with the idea that man is sexed, man and woman being of equal value with marriage given to mankind for procreation and mutuality, the wife being a helper to her husband. That's the, the, the fossil record, uh, the paleontological record is certainly not inconsistent with those notions. That work is good, a sacred sacrament, a sacred assignment by God to mankind to steward the earth and its creatures. That human exploration and discovery of the workings of nature are a natural outgrowth of man's capacities rather than divine bestowals without human initiative and effort. Men and women alike have freely chosen to disobey God. The, the, the sort of fallen nature, the sort of mystery of what's, what's wrong with us, what's wrong with us in our human nature that we do evil things, that we even do things that we disagree with. Um, yeah, I, 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 I visited people in prison who, who have said to me, I wasn't myself. And, uh, and we try to sort out how is it that we do things that we know we shouldn't do. Human sin, sin is cumulative and self-destructive, resulting in God's just judgment. And despite human rebellion against God, God's original purpose to bless all mankind remains intact as he graciously finds a way to work his will despite human defiance. And those are taken from Quest for the Historical Adam uh, by William Lane Craig, and it just uh, it just helps to show that the scientific, the scholarly, the paleontological, the anthropological, uh, all of the data uh, it doesn't it do, it's not incompatible with the basic story of Adam and Eve as shown in Genesis one, two, and three. Uh, showing God as creator, human beings as rebellious subjects, and human beings as being incapable of resolving things for themselves and being in need of a savior, in need of a redeemer, in need of a, of a messiah. Well, there's so much more to cover, especially when we talk about creation. When we begin to open up the book of, of science that reveals God's 
creative hand, God's design, the intelligent design of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the, the irreducible complexity of organs and species, and, and, uh, and even the idea of consciousness as we understand it from the human experience. But we're going to stop here at part one of Adam and Eve, which has been episode eight. This has been Transition to Hope with your host, Dr. Albert Spaulding. We care deeply about folks who are experiencing a faith crisis or who are trying to help a friend or fellow ward member sort through their shelf of questions. We want to be a positive and helpful resource for you. If you'd like to talk through your doubts, questions, or concerns in a safe and non-threatening dialogue, please reach out to us at our contact page at www.transitiontohope.org. You can also find show notes for today's podcast and other helpful information at our website. And if you'd care to donate to Transition to Hope, you can do so at the donate button. We'd love it if you would subscribe to our podcast and give us a rating. Meanwhile, we won't try to do your thinking for you, but we'd love to stand with you and be a resource for you as you seek coherent answers to life's big questions. Most of all, we care deeply about your faith journey. We want to help you transition to hope.